Okay, this one, uh, you know, I get asked all the time. I have people emailing and calling and so forth, and you know, they'll say, "What? You know, I, I met someone of the Mormon faith, or had a missionary come to my door. What do I do? How do I start it? How do I, you know, where do I take it? Uh, you know, and there's any number of ways uh, that I will tell them." you know, first to begin, when you have someone first come to your door, it's, you know, it's kind of tough to gauge where they're going to come from. They don't know you, you don't know them, uh, but they do have their set plan of what they want to study and how they want to direct the conversation. And so what I will usually tell people is just, you know, I would sit there on your first meeting at least, and just kind of listen to them. Uh, you can ask questions, you know, and just, you can tell them what, you know, you believe, you know, certain things, because they want to kind of get a feel for, you know, where they're, uh, going to be going and, you know, taking the uh, discussion. And so, uh, you know, what I usually tell people is just, you know, kind of hear them out and listen and ask, you know, ask some questions. It's never wrong to ask questions. Uh, there's a way to be respectful. You know, a lot of people, they get so, you know, they, they, they have this idea that, you know, if they come in, I've got to treat them disrespectfully, or I've got to be stern, or I've got to, you know, do, be certain ways. And we don't have to do that. We can, you know, there's a, we can sit down and talk, even though we might not be like-minded as far as faith is concerned, uh, we can still have that, those respectful discussions. And it's important to keep them civil and uh, take it as far as you can. And so uh, I'll usually just, you know, say, let them, you know, let them go. You'll see kind of with what they're going to be going for, ask those questions, make sure you, uh, define your terms or have them define their terms so that you can understand one another. And that's where, you know, we're really going to do. But I want to, uh, when you sit down and study with someone of the LDS faith, there are certain things to kind of keep in mind, certain things to stay away from, certain things that you can, you know, kind of push a little bit more. And that's what I'm going to go over. This is probably a bit shorter than, you know, the last hour. I know that was a lot of information. This will kind of make up for it, I guess. Um, be respectful. <laughs> That's the number one thing. There's no reason why we can't. There's, uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, you, you're essentially wanting the same thing. When they come to the door, they want, they're wanting to get you to heaven as much as you want to get them to heaven. Now, they are, you know, able to, you know, they, they do keep tabs on how many people they baptize, and they will, you know, the more the number, the more, the better it looks for them, and they will, you know, they like to boast about those numbers of, you know, baptizing and so forth, but. You know, you think you're trying to get, you know, you're trying to look out for each other and trying to get each other to heaven. They want, you know, they do have you in their best interest. They firmly believe that what they're doing is right. And they are. You know, I heard someone say not too long ago, and it really is kind of an eye opener for us, or it should be for members of the Lord's church, because we, you know, we talk about evangelism so frequently and saying, you know, we need to get out there and we need to talk to people and we do. And realistically, we don't. <laughs> You know, we don't, door knocking's not big now like it used to be. Um, and sometimes door knocking's not even the most effective way. So what do we do? What solutions can we find, you know, to get out there? They're big on door knocking. In fact, when you think about door knocking and people coming up to the door, two people, who do you generally think of <laughs> when you hear of them? The Mormons and who else? Jehovah's Witnesses, right? And people always talk about them that aren't a part of that faith in such a negative way, isn't it? That the people are coming up to the door. Why are they, you know, they're, why are they just bugging me? These people, I just see them out all the time and they're going to, that should be us. We should be the ones that they're talking about. We should be the ones that they know, hey, they, you know, the church of Christ, they, because what happened before they would meet house to house. They would go into the synagogues. They would go everywhere preaching the gospel. I mean, think of the mission work that we see in the in the first century, and women were on board as well. You look at Aquila and Priscilla and what they were doing, and how they how many lives they were changing with their mission work. Why aren't we the ones that they're talking about? You know, with with all of these things, but they have been doing this for years, and they're good at getting into neighborhoods, and they're good at knocking on those doors. And it's sad that the doctrine they're carrying with them is false. <laughs> But there's a lot of people catching on, you know, or that will, you know, they will respond to it because they like the way that they operate and they like how mission minded they are. They like how family oriented they are or how they will reach out and try to, you know, get involved with the communities. We could be doing that. And we don't have to sit here and just say, well, they, you know, why, you know, 
We can ask why all day long, but why are we not the ones getting out there and talking to people when we have that chance? And so, you know, but you think when they come to your door, though, they want to get you to heaven. I want to get them to heaven. And we're not going to get to heaven with two conflicting ways. You know, we, we kind of live in a religious world right now where people think, you know, you and I can have two opposing views and still be right. And that just cannot be, especially religiously, biblically, that can't be right. And so we need to you know, be able to sit down and reason through the scriptures with them. If you can reach them and just plant that inside or you know, do something to cause someone to chase the truth, it's going to be all the difference in the world. But be respectful. I mean, that just, you know, that goes without saying with, you know, especially in, you know, we see so much division in the world today. Why fall prey to it and just, you know, keep on with it. Number two, be honest in pursuing the truth. Weigh the evidence. Look at what the Bible has to say. Compare it to the Bible. You know, I'll constantly, or I'll ask frequently with, uh, you know, when I talk to someone of the LDS faith, what, you know, what would happen in fact, I've, I've written a tract. Um, I didn't bring any with me. I'll maybe try to get some here. Um, Ten questions to ask a Mormon. Okay? Never wrong to ask questions. But weigh the evidence. Make sure that, you know, that what you, do, you know, everything is being compared to the Bible. I'll ask him what, you know, what happens if you come up with something or you say something that is contradictory of what Paul said? Where do you go from there? What happens if, uh, you know, the Bible is contradictory of what the Book of Mormon says? And I'm going to get into something in just a minute here. You know, where, you know, where is it translated incorrectly, if it is translated incorrectly? But why, you know, when we sit down and study, weigh, you know, we ought to constantly be weighing the evidence. When I left Mormonism, it wasn't because I had a huge understanding of the Bible. I didn't. I, it was very limited at that point because we weren't taught a whole lot. We were taught the ins and outs of the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. We were encouraged as young people to read the Book of Mormon several times over so we get to know our history or what they say our history was. And so what do you do? I reasoned it because I just thought, you know what? I, you know, you start weighing the evidence and you start seeing the discrepancies even within their own theology. And that's where a lot of people have been, you know, let out of there. A lot of people have been let out because they say, look, this isn't, you know, adding up to what the Bible says. And you can't tell me what the discrepancies are in the Bible. The most you can tell me is, well, it's not translated correctly. Well, okay, where is it not trans? How is it not translated correctly? Where does the language go wrong in the original language? You know, and what we don't know now, but be honest, because if you're honest in pursuing the truth, you're going to cut, you know, you're going to, that's when you're really going to be able to reason the scriptures, the way that God expects us to do. God wrote the Bible in common language. It's not difficult to understand. You know, people always say, well, it's, you know, it's so hard, but it's because they don't read, they read the verse and not the chapter. They read the chapter and not the book. And, you know, you think this whole history between the Old Testament and the New Testament is such a tight history that God has. God's plan was meant so that people that have our knowledge and our understanding, and he gave us that ability, can reason through it. We can comprehend it. Yes, I don't know the mind of God completely, but God didn't say you have to know everything that I know. He said, this is what I'm going to give you. This is what I want you to know. And I'm going to give you the brain power to be able to figure it out. And I thank him every day for it, that we can know what we have to do in order to be added to the kingdom of Christ. We can know. And I can know what I have to do to remain faithful, that it is obedience with it, that it's not, you know, you, that you don't just say some sinner's prayer. We don't find that in the Bible anyway. You know, when you look at what the, what, you know, what that sinner's prayer is, and I know the Mormons don't believe in the sinner's prayer, but, uh, you know, but you look at what some of the religious teachings on being saved is all about. Look at what the sinner's prayer is. I'm saying, you know what, Jesus, I don't want to follow your word. Now think about how this is, how it's structured. Because the sinner's prayer is saying, oh, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. Think of how that must sound to him. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to follow your word. You come into my heart, Jesus. 
Is that the right way we ought to be trying to get a relationship with Christ? You come into my heart? The Bible doesn't teach that, does it? What does John 14, 15 say? If you love me, you love me, what? You keep my commandments. He didn't say anything about coming into our hearts. And then you flip-flop, John 15, 14. Whoever of you are you know, my friend, what? You're going to obey me. You're going to be my disciple. You're going to, you know, this is a relationship, but he, there are expectations that Christ has if we want to have that with him. And he wants that more than anything with us, but he's not just going to give it to us. That's universalism. Christ could just say, well, you know what? I want everybody to be saved and then there's going to be no hell. But we know that's not the case because there are people based on the free will that God has blessed us with having, and Gabriel talked about this last night, there's, God gave us a free will. But when you give someone a choice, what kind of a choice can they make? <laughs> they make a bad one, isn't it? He gave Adam and Eve a choice. And they showed what, the, you know, what you can do with that choice. You give anyone a choice, and, they, you know, and there can be bad choices then. And he knew that, but he sets up this plan, and there's not, and it wasn't a fail-safe plan. Don't listen to the premillennialists who say, "Well, Jesus came down to this earth and he failed. That's why we're going to have you know this other kingdom that has to be established later." God never failed. People failed because we didn't listen to him. They crucified him, but the plan never failed. God had this plan. There is absolutely nothing new, nothing new that God can know. He's already known it. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. There's nothing new that God, you know, that God can, you know, God works in a logical way, doesn't he? Everything is logic to God. You know, people try to hang it up and ask questions like, well, can God create a stone so big that he can't carry it, that he can't lift it? Well, first off, who cares? But if you want to really get technical with it, no, he can't. Why? Because it's illogical. He's God. He's it. He is the most powerful being. He is the most, you know, there's, you can't get better than God. It's illogical to think something like that. God will never, you know, it's impossible for the most powerful being to create something more powerful than he is. And so God works in, you know, but he has given us this word with his mind and he has simplified this word for us, because he wants that relationship with us, we mean that much to him in this amazing, I mean, this huge universe and all of the solar systems and all of the telescopes of what they can see. And we are the most important thing to him. He gave us minds, souls, consciousness, because he loves us that much. That is an amazing thing to think about. You want to feel wanted, look, read the Bible, because the Bible will tell you how valuable you are to your creator. But be honest when we pursue that. Sinner's prayer never get us you know, to heaven because it's not how Christ wanted it. Weigh the evidence. In everything, when you look at more, you know, when you start looking at the more, you know, what, what Mormonism believes in God and who he is. And I mean, they limit him so much, <laughs> but weigh the evidence. Look at what the Bible says about God. Look at that relationship God wants to have with man. Look at what has, you know, what the expectations and be honest. <laughs> Third, don't assume that everyone defines a term the same way. I think that's probably one of the biggest hangups we get in discussions is we think or we assume someone else knows the same thing I do or they understand it the same way that I do. If I say a word, it might not mean the same thing to you as it means to me. And try, I mean, you think of just, you know, all the English language. We, we, man, we've messed up in the English language because there are so many, so much slang over the years and it, you know, and there are words that mean other, that sound the same and mean different things and words that have changed over the years. And, you know, a perfect example. I mean, you say, you know, if I, I use the term gay today, what does it mean? <laughs> you know what it means today, right? If I use that 50 years ago, what did it mean? <laughs> no one ever thought that it would mean that, uh, you know, what it means today. 
words take on different meaning over time. And so when you, so it's important and you see this in, you know, in scripture as well. You look in first Corinthians chapter 15 in the King James version at that point, the word is charity. What is the correct translation of that? Love. Now, when we look at that word charity, what do we think of today? Because we're thinking modern day America, our English that we understand today, what's charity? <laughs> Giving something. You realize you can do charitable works and you don't even have to love them. <laughs> you don't. I can do it as a tax write-off. How great is that? <laughs> I don't have to love that person. I can do it for, in fact, I can give for completely for self-gain. <laughs> But that's not what he was talking about. It was love in the most purest form. It was an agape love, meaning that was, you know, you, you love someone, you prove that you love them. That's the kind of love God has for us. John 3, 16, God so loved, that's agape love, the world, what? That I'm going to prove it. How am I going to prove it? Give him the only begotten son. That's love. <laughs> and so we need to make sure that we start to define terms and we, you know, we're very clear when we sit down with someone. Make sure you define. Remember what we talked about the first article of faith. You know, and we believe in God, the eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. And it sounds great to us. And we just think, how many people have walked away saying, great, we just, you know, we're on board with each other spiritually. Until you realize that God is not really eternal in the way that they teach. Make sure that you start to define terms the same way. And that might take some time and sitting down and getting to know who they are. Don't assume all Mormons believe the same thing. I think that's another hang-up that we kind of have. We think, you know, they come to our door and we sit down with someone and we just think, you know what, they're all going to, you know, they're all going to believe the same thing and they're all going to understand it the same way. And so I can talk to this Mormon the way that I talk to this one over here. And that's not the case. They might not understand anything there might, you know, there are things a lot of the time, there are things that are said by their superiors that they don't, you know, that they don't get yet. Someone that hasn't been in the mission field that long, someone who hasn't been in the LDS faith that long, aren't going to understand things the same way. They haven't been taught it yet. And so don't assume that all Mormons believe the same thing. And that's why you go back to the last one. Make sure that you, you know, that you define your terms. And it's, and it's amazing when you start to sit down with someone, you know, it, when, when you have Mormon missionaries come to your door, there's always one that has been in the field for, a, you know, quite a while. They only have maybe six months left or a few months left. The other one is brand new. He's fresh off the boat. He's right there in there. He's getting trained. He's learning, you know, he's learning the steps. He's gaining his courage to go door to door and not care if, you know, doors are slammed in his face. He's, he's learning the ropes and you sit down. And a lot of successes come from that young man. And you find the right one. It doesn't take a whole, a whole lot to figure out which one is which. They're trained when they, they can't answer something to either change the subject or to answer it with another question for you, putting you on the defensive. And if you can hit the young man that hasn't been out there you know, a long time, there have been a lot of cases where someone will ask a question and they'll say, well, I've never thought of that because they're trained. They've, you know, they've heard so many different questions, so many different things. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute with what to stay away from. Things that people just have assumed about Mormons, uh, doctrines that have been assumed about them. But if you can pull them off, to, you know, off of what they have been trained and how to train, how they've been trained to answer, you've got your, you know, that's the angle right there. That's where you're going to have that success because you're going to hit them where they're not used to it. And there've been a lot of cases where these young men, people have, you know, they start talking to the young man. The other one tries to, you know, speak up and try to change it. And they say, no, no, no. I ask him, let, you know, let's let him answer it. And there's a nice way to do it. But he starts studying. And, the, you know, a lot of the times they'll say, wow, I never thought about it like that. And they will start chasing the truth. And there have been young men that have left the church because of that. Now, on the flip side of that, they will report back to their mission president. The mission president is the one that's always in the area, and the mission they always have to, you know, 
They, they tell them how many Bible studies they have going. They tell them, you know, what's going on, who they've met, where they've been, all sorts of different things. And they keep tabs, tight tabs on them. And if there's one that starts questioning and they see that, you know what happens? They will pull them out from that area and you'll probably never even see him again. So you've got to be careful with some of the things that, you know, that we say. Some of the, you know, techniques that we might have to use. Because, they, you know, and they, they, people always say, well, I'll just stay in touch with now. It's not that easy. They know who they're staying in touch with. They know that they're going, that you, they're talking to you. They know where the line of, you know, where the discussion's going. Because if he doesn't say it, his companion is going to, you know, his, com his companion has no loyalties to him. They place them together. And they might have been only been together a couple of months. You know, they become friends and they're nice to each other. But, you know, he'll, you know, before without batting an eye, talk to him. Because he wants, you know, he's... You know, he's, he's gaining all this experience and attention and so forth. But don't assume that they all know the same thing. That's why it's important to stay away from sensitive subjects. There are certain things that you should never, never, never talk to them about. Joseph Smith is one of them. They hold him high up. Remember the very first session, what he thought of himself as being, they hold him just as high. He is on the same level of Christ to some people. And when you start bad-mouthing Joseph Smith or start questioning his history, his family were scoundrels. I'm not, you know, you don't, there's no other way to put it. They were into treasure hunting. They were into the occult. They were arrested numerous times because of different things that had happened illegally. But if you bring that up, you know what they're going to say? Well, it's propaganda. That's all it is. You're just listening to all this propaganda and it's not true. And, you know, on and on and on they'll go. And so, and you'll never get that second Bible study. I don't have to go after Joseph Smith. That's why whenever I study with someone or I talk to someone of the Mormon faith, I stay on doctrine because doctrine is what's going to change them. I can know all the history I want about Joseph Smith. That does not, that's not going to get someone to heaven. I can know all the things that he did and all the illegal things and I can show newspapers and all the documentation and all the evidence about what he did. But how's that going to get someone to heaven? <laughs> Stay on doctrine. Stay away from polygamy. That's the one thing. Everyone talks about polygamy with the Mormon. They always ask, you know, do they practice it today? I get that question all the time. Do they practice it today? What are their stance on it today? And I'll tell you, there's, you know, so, do they practice it? Yes and no. Some do. There's a there's a group out there called the Fundamental LDS Church. They're the ones that stick, you know, all, you know, with it long before this. Brigham Young is the one that said you can't go to heaven unless you are a polygamist, unless you have multiple wives. You can't have you can't go to heaven without it. And there are people that still follow that, you know, to the core. When I was living, you know, when I was living in Utah, and they still have them there. I would drive my wife, you know, past one of their compounds or their big homes, and you'd see a lot of cars out in front, and uh, and you know, and you'd know that's the everyone knows that's a polygamist house. You know, everyone lives. You go into Walmart or Target, and you'll see the wives. You know, and they're usually dressed from the neck all the they'll have the, from the neck all the way to the ankles covered in dresses, and they're all the same. You know that those are the polygamist wives. Now you don't see that a whole lot, but they are still there. It's changed over the course of time. They've, you know, they've, you know, in the church in the late 1800s, they start to reform some of the things going on in the church and they shied away from polygamy. And they said, no, we don't practice it now. Uh, and so depending on who you talk to, some of them might. I knew a guy, I was friends with him for a while, I lost touch with him, but he was actually came from a polygamist home. His, you know, he had well, he had one mom, obviously, that birthed him, but then he would have all these women that were in the house that were the multiple wives, and his mom was one of them. And it was interesting, you know, hearing what his home life was like. But stay away from polygamy. They've heard it all, and they've, you know, they've dealt with it. That's not going to get you to that next Bible study. It's not going to, certainly not going to progress it in any way. Stay on, you know, stay on point with what the scriptures have to say. Stay away from racism. They do have a racist past. You know, we talked about how they believe that dark skin were the curse of, you know, of certain people. And for a long time, those with dark skin could never hold the priesthood. They would baptize them. They would, uh, you know, they would allow them to, you know, to join the church. But they could never hold the priesthood or any kind of priesthood that they would have. Remember, they brought, tried to bring back the Levitical priesthood, which is still, they say, is today. 
why they have it, I don't know. You can bring back one part of the law. You need to bring back all of it. But still, nonetheless, you know, it wasn't until the late 70s. Spencer Kimball was the prophet. Now, I remember this because it was a huge uproar over it. Spencer W. Kimball, who was the prophet, said, I went in and I got this new revelation. We're going to allow people with dark skin to hold the priesthood. And everyone thought it was so great. Oh, we got this revelation. You know, we're going to change everything. Now people can do it. And now those who are you know, dark skin, who are in it, wasn't necessarily just, you know, African-Americans. It was everyone with dark skin. Here's what they didn't say at that time. Right around that same time, there was a temple being built down in Brazil. Mormon temple. Well, you look at, you know, a true Brazilian and their skin tone, is it as light as mine? No. Well, where do you get the labor to build this temple down in Brazil? So a lot of them started, you know, they were building this, but then they, you know, they wanted to join, you know, with the Mormon church and hold certain positions. And they said no. And so there was, they, you know, you can imagine there was people upset. Well, these individuals pressed a lawsuit against the Mormon church. And it wasn't going to look good publicly to build a temple in a place where most of the members going into that temple couldn't even hold a position for it. And it looked really bad PR wise for the LDS church. And so they, you know, was, and that's when Spencer Kimball went in and said, Oh no, I, you know, I got this revelation and everything's going to change. And so coincidentally, they just, I guess, you know, changed all this, but stay away from that race. There is a quiet racism that's in Utah still to this day. You don't see a lot of it. It's, it's not as vocal as it was, but there's still some tones and, you know, depending on who you talk to. Uh, temple ceremonies. Everyone asks about all the secret ceremonies. You know, I was involved with it, you know, with baptism for the dead. That's one of their special ceremonies. They have secret wedding ceremonies. They have secret, what they call endowment uh, ceremonies. There's a lot of different things that take place in the temple that you will never know take place and not know unless someone, you know, exposes it. Uh, some people have. They've, you know, they've gone in, they've, secretly film certain things and how they do it i don't know but uh, it's interesting you can probably find it on youtube i mean they'll probably release it but anyway everyone wants to know what all these secret ceremonies. don't question that there's a reason they're secret <laughs> they're not going to talk about secret ceremonies to someone that they just met <laughs> and so it's best not to even you know to to go there and again how is that going to get them any closer to christ <laughs> talking about these secret ceremonies. You might cast some doubt. That might not be such a bad thing to just, you know, if you can plant that seed of doubt, but it's certainly not going to, you know, doctrinally, it's not going to do anything. And so stay away from these, because remember, we want to get that second study, the third study. We want to open that line of dialogue. We want to establish a relationship because the longer that relationship goes or the longer you're able to talk to them, the more you're going to be able to talk to them about there's going to be issues that you can't have in that first dis discussion that two months down the road, you can start pressing certain things because they're going to start to trust you and they're going to start to open up a little bit. And you are going to start to be able to get to some of what they're, you know, what they really believe about certain things. And, and so, you know, keep it open as much as you possibly can and, uh, you know, keep that dialogue going. Focus, like I said, on doctrine and core issues surrounding the truth. That's where, you know, you, I mean, we sit down with the Bible with anyone. You know, we do, you know, yes, find commonality. That's, you know, how you, a lot of the time how you get in. I remember going on a campaign and um, we were, I think it was in uh, Florida or Georgia. Anyway, we we're doing some door knocking and there was a, uh, one of the classmates uh, knocked on the door and a guy wanted nothing to do with him. Well, my friend was a Georgia Bulldogs fan, big Georgia Bulldog fan. And the guy just happened to have a sticker on his truck with the Georgia Bulldog. And he said, hey, I noticed you're a Bulldogs fan. And the guy said, yeah. And he said, I'm a big Bulldog fan. And it opened up a line. He ended up getting a Bible study with this guy <laughs> because, because of football. <laughs> but when you can find that common ground, that's how it happened for me. Everyone asks, you know, how did, well, what happens when, you, you know, how did you, you know, how were you converted? How were you... You know, I there were several a number of years after I left Mormonism before I became before I was added to the Lord's Church, 
because I left, I was mad. I was, I had a lot of animosity. I you know, when I came out of it, I had the same kind of attitude a lot of people had. And that is, if this isn't true, nothing can be true. And I really went through a lot of anger and had to work through a lot of anger when I first came out of it. So a number of years pass and I started dating a girl and her uncle is a member of the Lord's church. Uh, well, this girl and I, you know, we, we, in fact, we got so far as to be engaged and then she kind of dumped me. My wife will tell you that's the best thing that could have happened to me. So, and I agree, but her uncle was a member of the Lord's church. She and I started going to a Baptist church for a little while. And I asked him some questions and uh, he, you know, brought out, uh, he, he was an FBI agent, a field agent, which I thought was really neat. And he brought, he would bring home weapons as, you know, this machine guns and all kinds of things that he would break down at home and everything. And so I was just fascinated by all of this. And, um, and that's how, that was his commonality with me. And we just started talking and got, and gained that relationship. And over the course of time, uh, you know, I started trusting him more and more and started asking about what the, you know, what the church of Christ was. I'd never heard of it. And I went back to our pastor at this Baptist church and I said, what do you know about the church of Christ? Oh, they're a cult. I think they're the only ones going to heaven. <laughs> so I go back to him. His name is Leslie. And I said, Leslie, he said it was a cult. You're a cult. <laughs> Your father, is that true? <laughs> uh, and he said, okay, could you do something for me? And I said, okay. He said, you ever read the book of Acts? I said, no, never have. He said, could you do me a favor? Could you read the book of Acts for me? He said, I would love to talk to you about this. But he says, if you could read the book of Acts and don't ask questions from anyone, not me, not your pastor, no one. You sit down with it and write down things that you notice in the book of Acts that might be different than what you've been taught about baptism about, you know, just worship, all these different things. And I said, okay. And I'd never, no one had ever told me that before. And I started reading it and it was an eye opener for me. I was, it's one of those things where you just, I mean, you have that breakthrough moment where you just think, how did I not see this before? How did I not see? You know how many Bible studies I've had with people that had that exact same reaction when you get them into the Bible, saying the exact same thing with the exact same response. How did I not see this? Why did they not teach this to me? And I went back to him and I said, okay. He said, did you notice some difference? I said, oh yeah. And we talked a little bit further and I ended up getting baptized. And it was just amazing. He didn't do anything. All he did was get me into what the Word of God is. Stick to the core doctrines. That's what's going to change people. I can talk all day long about all these issues that are, you know, that seem like you know, they become more distractions than anything else. But if you can stick to those core doctrines, stick to the issues surrounding the truth, that is what's going to get people to change. That is how they're going to respond to it. You think of, you know, the person studying with you and I was bullheaded. I thought I knew and I had a handle and, you, you know, that I had such a, and so many of us are the same way, aren't we? We just, we just know, we are convinced that we know religiously what's what until I start reading, until I figure out I don't. And that's the, the only thing that's going to do it is the Bible. I can listen to someone speak for hours, but it's never going to do what the Bible is going to do for me when I can get inside of that and start reasoning through it and reading it. There is no religion. I don't care if it's Mormonism, what denomination it is out there. You start getting them into the Bible. If they're honest and they start pursuing the word of God, that is what's going to change lives because that's what's going to get you to heaven. You're going to figure out, this is what I need to do. This is what's been missing in my life. This is why I need to get from here to here. Is there th are there things going on in my life? Yes, absolutely. God didn't say that he was just going to wash everything away, but you know what? There is no one, no one that is going to be able to get you through those things like God can. You stay faithful to God. He'll get you through it. It's, it doesn't mean he's going to pay all your bills, and it doesn't mean he's going to you know, wipe, you know, wipe the slate clean. It doesn't mean that he's going to you know, it'd be great sometimes, I guess we think, oh, I've got bills due and they're piling up and I'm living from paycheck to paycheck and I don't have food in my fridge and I don't have this and this and this and this and this. 
But you know what? When I have that relationship with Christ, I know, okay, that's there. I know I have to deal with that, but you know what? So someone comes and stocks food for my fridge one week. That'd be great, and we're certainly thankful for that. But there's, you know, look longer term. Look at that relationship with him. He's going to be able to calm me down enough to where I can say, okay, now I've got some clarity with all of this. Now I can sit there and, you know, I can piece this together. When I've got, you know, when I've got peace with him, I know how to work through things. I can do it. And I know that there's people out there like-minded that I can turn to that can help me with it as well. No one wants to see anyone suffer. Lord's people should certainly not want to see anyone suffer. But there, you know, you have that relationship with him. Stay to the, you know, to those things surrounding the truth. Ask relevant questions to propel honest conclusions. Ask him why. Why, you know, why would you, you know, would you, you know, what would you follow anything in the Bible, or what would you, you know, if, if you found out the Bible contradicts the Book of Mormon, would, and you know for a fact that it does, or if it did, would you renounce Mormonism? Here's what something that was interesting. My wife, my wife asked this question when we were on Temple Square in Salt Lake City, the Temple grounds. Uh, you're walking around, and they have their Mormon missionaries that are around, and the sister missionaries, the females that are there, they come around, and the, you know, one approached us, and you know, she was very nice, and my wife wanted to. <laughs> Just, and she knew what she was going to say, but she said it anyway. But she asked her, this, this female missionary, what, what would, uh, she, or she goes, would you, if I never heard of the Book of Mormon, that's how she said it. If I never heard of, heard of the Book of Mormon at all, could I still go to heaven? She said, yes. She said, well, why do I need the Book of Mormon? I can't go to heaven without this. I can't know how to get to heaven without this. But she got her to say, I can go to heaven without the Book of Mormon. Do you know why? Because that Book of Mormon will never, never usurp the authority that this has right here. Ask those questions that are going to propel those answers. Ask, you know, and then we can do it in a nice way. But get those conclusions. Ask those, you know, thought-provoking questions. And the only way to do it is to discuss it with them. There's no magic question that's going to be the end-all, beat-all question that gets them out of there. Remember, this is a process. You're wanting to get them to a certain point where they start thinking about things. And above all else, be patient with them. Be patient. Remember, they could be years, have years worth of a life in that religion being taught week in and week out a certain way. Be patient. People are patient with us. We owe it to them to be patient. There's a reason they believe as strongly as they do. There's a reason for it. They're convinced of the truth or that they know what the truth is. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's sit down and let's see what the Bible says. Gus Nichols, whenever he would uh, study the Bible with someone, would always ask three questions to someone that he was studying with. And it's three questions I want to ask this morning is three questions I would always, that I love asking to different people when I study with them now. Number one is, do you want to do what is right? Do you want to do what is right? Do you want to do what is right right now? Are you willing to let the Bible determine what is right? We need that standard of authority. That's how we're going to get to the truth. And that's how we're going to be able to get someone to change. But change according to what God wants and have that relationship. Appreciate it. Uh, next hour, if you have any questions, make sure you write them down and I will be hitting as many as I can with it.